are we trending in the right direction? Is, 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 is something happening? Uh, we have no choice, which is mm. why my optimism is, uh, and why I think that, that there, will, there will be a big shift coming. Let me uh, give you another uh, flavor of numbers. Climate finance come, to date has been about 660 billion, talking about scale mm -hmm. of financing, 660 billion. 28 billion of this has been in the food and, and agriculture sector, which is about 4.5%. If we, if we equate it to the emissions from the sector, which is one third, 33%, and even with the 660 as a constant, we are looking at 220 billion coming into this. So I think that is, and that's exactly why there is a lot of optimism also about the COP28 and being fo focused on the food systems transformation that we, do, we need to figure, we need to break this in terms of having climate finance, not just going into energy transition, but coming into food. food From system. a world perspective, yes. But of course, uh, I come into this conversation, particularly with an Africa perspective. Is there a risk that this need for transformation also in the developed world, also in China, also in other markets, is actually not going to be a, a good thing for Africa because these countries are going to be more inward looking and more inwardly investing in their own transformations. Do you see that risk? I think if the world wants to not have more conflict, it cannot afford to look inwards. It cannot have different standards in different countries because it is bound to create global unrest. Mm. Um, um, you know, so, so I, I, no, I, I, I think, I think I, I think it's going to be more global. It's not going to get more uh, insular. What would you say to people who say, to that point, we actually have to become a little bit sharper in painting some doom scenarios. Like, the, 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 what, what is going to be the implication of not acting on this situation, in, on the need, the financing need for Africa, for food and agriculture, in terms of the other countries, there's a huge element of self-interest in it, isn't it? In, in investing in, in, in climate mitigation and in food and agriculture in order to prevent population migration, etc. But I, I, I don't hear a lot of that debate. It's, it's, it's like in the background. So um, a big takeaway for, for me personally at the UN food system stock taking that, that happened a month ago or two months, wherever we are in the calendar now, was a big a statement um, that the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action. Okay, and 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 uh, so I I at least in the rooms that I am in, I see a lot of convergence that that there that we cannot we cannot let go of the last mile, mm. um, and that and including on you talked about the debt. Mm. I mean, I think there is a huge conversation happening out there in terms of debt and food security and whether there can be some kind of a uh, instrument um, that really uh, supports countries in, in their debt restructuring in order to achieve food and nutrition security. Um, so. so you look after global ad, uh, agriculture and two days ago I, I, I launched somewhat of a controversial statement um, that um, and it's a personal statement, I, don't, I, say, I don't say that on behalf of any institution, that we might have done a disservice to Africa by launching this statement, African Solutions for Africa. Right? We, we've heard that many times. But as I say, maybe we should say the right solutions for Africa, i.e., do we spend enough time in looking around and copy-pasting solution? And I'm thinking specifically, and you're Indian, so you know that very well, um, the priority sector lending system in India, which has succeeded in pushing or sucking in enormous amount of capital in the agricultural sector. Why don't we talk about these kind of sort of dramatic intervention in the Africa context, or, and should we? Absolutely. I think your first comment or your second, second line that there should be right solutions for Africa is exactly the right headline. Hmm. Um, and, and why not? If there has been good examples out there that, are, uh, that can be scaled up, why not, right? And, and again, out of the G20, I, I think um, they have the leader summit uh, this weekend. Um, one of the, 
success uh, or something to talk about is uh, for the first time, the G20 Leaders Summit, which means 20 heads of state plus 10 observing countries. So 30 heads of state are going to sign off on the principles for food systems transformation, food and nutrition, uh, food systems transformation for food and nutrition security. And it hits on each and all aspects about getting the policy environment right, the, 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 the repurposing agenda, about scaling innovation. Uh, food systems is the least disrupted, and yet there are technologies out there. Um, and, and again, there is, there is a lot happening, except I think the problem, the base is so low that we haven't yet seen these, these, these outcomes reflected but I am, again, very but optimistic to that, point, that in about a year's time, there will be a very different conversation happening because results will be seen. Um, and the third is about the, the financing. Now, financing, the private finance, uh, just to... So the perception of the sector is, you know, high risk, low returns, too fragmented, not bankable projects is, is sort of the lingo heard. And so a big push now is, okay, let's unbundle the sector. What are the three big emitters, okay? Um, and of course, I'll hit the adaptation agenda in a second. Um, and that's essentially livestock, uh, rice, uh, and uh, food loss and waste. And so the, now the thing is, okay, low emission rice. We are looking at 15 countries. And again, we are moving into not small projects that doesn't aspire interest and excitement from the private finance, world of private finance, but a $40 billion bottom line, a huge uh, extension services, uh, and a very important public-private uh, partnership. Um, uh, in agro-logistics, there's a lot happening even on this continent in terms of cold chains. And again, looking for a low emission cold chains in terms of the choice of renewables and so on and so forth. And, and the third is on, on, uh, on livestock, uh, is sustainable livestock. Today, um, at the, the, the growing demand from all nations, from Africa on livestock is huge. And, and the challenge there is about planet and people, whereas it's very important for the equity and food security, food and nutrition security uh, to move into low emission. And today in Africa, investments on livestock are hovering about two billion a year, of which 50 cents to every dollar is climate co-benefit. So these, these, we are not talking enough of good things happening, but I also agree that they are not happening at a scale, but, but a year later. <clears throat> we are getting a better and better grasp on the, on the challenge. And it feels like the size of the challenge becomes bigger and bigger. I, I want to pick up on a statement you make about, but we are progressing. I, I also ahead of this panel, I try to, to find some evidence like that we said five years ago, we need $60 billion. I don't know the precise number, but it was in that. Five years ago, we said, we have to find $60 billion for agro and food systems. And I can't get my hand around, like, did we find 10 or 15? I, I, so it's also a question for the panelists that come later on. It does, does anybody has a, has a grasp around, are we actually closing the gap or is the gap getting bigger? So I'm, I'm really curious about So. So is, is, uh, is it a gut feel that you say we are actually closing the gap or does the World Bank have solid evidence of it? There is a, a financing tool. And again, don't get upset with the word tool. I too get upset, but there is a, <laughs> um, where we've looked now uh, in about six countries, uh, two in Africa, in terms of what is happening to financial flows on food and agriculture. And a large part of it is also remember that we, uh, we, there is no budget line item on government's budget that says food systems. So what is the definition of food systems when one is trying to look at budget is also not a trivial exercise. Having done that now, uh, is the, the idea then what is happening to financial flows, both public um, uh, domestic spending as well as uh, um, um, development finance and climate finance coming in. And, and a big, um, uh, re and, and, and an ability to really reflect what is the policy priority versus where funds are going. You're absolutely right that because of the, what you had said in the beginning between COVID, 
um, and and um, um, debt other, and climate uh, crisis, uh, food uh, debt exactly. and climate crisis. Yeah. A large part of spending in the last few years has gone towards short term. Yeah. Okay. On addressing really day to day. But the bottom line is, unless and until we don't break out of this circle, we are going to keep doing short-term financing Absolutely, yeah. and not moving into the longer food systems. There will be a value of transition for sure, where yields will get affected, where incomes will get affected. This is exactly where then the rest of the world has to come together in providing um, uh, additional financing uh, for uh, income support and social protection. But we also can't afford all financing going into short term. No, of course not. No, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that I speak with an optimist. And some, the, please, uh, other panel members, whenever you feel appropriate, pick up on these questions that I launched here. And I'm interested, like I'm sure many in the audience, to get a little bit more visibility on this question is, are we, are we progressing? Because if we are progressing, we should replicate what we are doing well. And... And I don't know what we should be replicating. Should we should we construct more forty million dollar funds, or is that a, or has that been proven as not making a dent in the challenge? There's, I think, three parameters that that we usually look at: is what is the government spending on agriculture and food system? And as far as I know, in Africa, that hasn't really materially moved. It stays far away from the ten percent commitment. Mm -hmm. Secondly. Uh, uh, banks, what, a, what part of the lending book of banks is going to uh, agro and foods? I think it has moved somewhat. I think, uh, but I, I have no real clear visibility. As, and if any of the panel members can give more visibility on that, I would be very happy. And thirdly, development organizations. And there, of course, we know that it's becoming under increasing stress in terms of the total money flows that's coming into it. But so let's explore that further. Said it was a real pleasure. I, uh, <laughs> sorry that I didn't have the fire organized. I'm supposed, according to my program, and talk about accuracy, I'm supposed to finish at 9.22, okay? 9.22, which it is precisely now. So thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, a great pleasure. <laughs> On to the first panel. Uh, can I ask the first panelist to um, come forward? That is Gunther uh, BG, if I pronounce that well. Gunther? Peter Umanai, Brent Malahai, Binta, Temi Adegoroye, Teobal Sabe, and Samuel, Samuel Akilanyu. We only have 20 minutes uh, for this panel. So uh, I'm going to just throw questions, questions at you, which you should have been able to have, have a look at. Um, where, where relevant, also pick up on this overhanging, the big question that I've been raising in the fireside chat. So if you, if you have an opinion about that big question, are we progressing? Is there stuff that really works and that we should scale up? So really try to address that as well. And I'm going to take it in the order of, 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 the, of the briefing that you have received. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to make it complicated. Peter? Hi, Peter. So um, from your perspective, um, which policy and regulatory measures can governments implement uh, to create an enabling environment for food systems and agro-systems to absorb and to receive more financing? Thank you very much. I think uh, because this is my first time to speak, so my name is Peter Umune, and I work for the Global Environment Facility based in Washington, D.C., and I lead um, food system and agriculture portfolio um, at the Jeff. So, uh, you know, just uh, let me uh, first uh, talk a little bit about the Jeff. What is the Jeff? Because that is a very important. Um, it's a pretty much the last, the, the largest multilateral uh, funding uh, trust fund for now, um, and we provide funding to support countries meet the commitment under different um, um, UN conventions. So this is the biodiversity, climate change, uh, desertification, climate, uh, uh, chemical and waste, and but also international water. And largest, been, how much? How much is it? What, what does largest mean? Yeah, so um, just some comments. Okay. So um, we've been in the business for about 30 years, and we've been uh, providing grants for about $21.9 billion dollars. Um, that is on a grant, but also there is a co-financing that comes with that, which is around 
117 billion dollars of co-financing, right? So this is not, it, it sounds like a small amount for 30 years, but it's quite enough uh, for, for some, uh, some countries. Um, and in agricultural sector, uh, because that is uh, what the, the discussion now, we've been uh, since 2014, uh, this is the portfolio I lead, we've been trying to implement what we call integrated approach on agriculture funding and food system. So for, for example, in Africa, we had this portfolio on $106 million in 12 countries for resilient food system. And this is uh, Tanzania was one, Uganda, and so on. And we provide this funding basically to support countries meet the priorities under the, uh, the, the food system agenda, but also looking at smallholder uh, production. So that, that's, that's number one. Then we moved into a, a, another program that we call food, land use, and restoration, where we really wanted to combine the, the sustainability practices and, and land use planning at the, at the uh, landscape level. This is a big portfolio that is actually led by the World Bank. So it's about $350 million that we put for 27 countries, including nine in, in, in Africa. And we've seen that this is really much generating about $2.9 billion in co-financing. And as I speak right now, I'm leading another program that we call Food System Integrated Program. And quite frankly, the, the, the deadline for submission is tomorrow. Um, and this is putting about $250 million for countries to implement the food system pathways, increase uh, finance uh, from private sector, but also some innovations that come with it, right? So, so that's just the number, but that is the grant. Um, the other side is actually the blended finance, because that's what we're speaking about. Because historically, as the blended finance has been very small pocket of money to pilot something uh, with commercial banks. And we established the blended finance at the Jeff really to unlock that private investment to commercial banks. And uh, as I speak again, uh, there is a call for proposal where we really want uh, private companies, commercial banks, domestic bank, to really access that about $15 million to de-risk some of the, uh, the activities that otherwise they would not potentially put money on. Um, and that is something that we do at the, the small scale, which is an instrument. Peter, but, but these, again, numbers, these numbers, are they today bigger than they were five years ago? Is it, is it, is it scaling up? Is it getting bigger? Yeah, of course, I will say for our perspective, it is. Because uh, under, we, we receive money, we, uh, the way we program our money is basically uh, uh, through funding cycle. And the last replenishment that we started last year, we get $5.3 billion from donors, which is about 30% increase in our previous cycle, right. right? So I would say this is actually progressing, you know, because uh, that's something that we see progress. And that is very much to, uh, to thank some of our donor countries that are putting money really into making that real change. So that, that's pretty much for me, I would say it's progressing. But let me be clear here, uh, because we're speaking about the blended finance. We have to, I have to really, you have to close in 30 seconds. Yes, of course. Yeah, so I think our, our role on the blended finance is very clear. So we want to provide patient funding to allow private sector to invest. And in that regard, I think we are pretty much the one that um, are very flexible in that regard to improve the flow from private, uh, private finance. Thank so you. we really need them to come on board and bring some good projects and work with farmers, uh, small scale, uh, medium enterprises and countries to get to that level of uh, financing. Thank you. Thank I you. hope I respond to your question, but uh, I, I took a bit of liberty. No worries, no worries. But yes. at least you, you say we are put, it's getting bigger. The numbers are getting bigger. That's yes. really where the sausage is, right? Yes. The numbers are getting bigger. Now, can I go to, um, to Brent, Brent Malahai? Um, challenges and opportunities uh, in adapting impact, impact investment to enhance agricultural productivity and promote inclusive growth. I'm Brent Malahay, Chief Strategy Officer at Equity Bank. 
So I'll, I'll answer this question with a framing question in mind, and that is, how do we commercialize a fragmented value chain that is populated by businesses that are really just thinking of the current cycle, if not the next cycle? So very short term. So impact investing and blended finance in general has or can have two roles. One is a catalytic role and the other is a scaling role. So on the catalytic side, these are value chains that require a lot of capacity building. We need to train farmers, we need to send kids to school so that we have more better trained uh, agronomists, uh, we need the banks that need to be internally capacitated as well. So partners like foundations, NGOs, play a role or can play a role and do play a role in, in catalytic uh, aspects of the value chain. On the scaling side, these value chains are not in a position, and it was earlier commented, that they're not fit for purpose at the moment. So we need the development finance institutions to support and help scale up what is not currently a competitive value chain. There is no doubt, and we don't need to articulate the opportunities that Africa has for food and agriculture. So longer term, the opportunity is there, but in the near term, there is catalytic, there is scaling initiatives that is required. And in every part of this value chain that has different players, small, large, commercial, formal, informal, there is, varying, there is different needs of financing that, that is required. Brent, are we going in the right direction? So catalytic, supposed to pull in more capital, is it, is it accelerating? So this speaks to the business models that are currently in place as private sector. As I mentioned, there's internal capacity or capacitation that is required with players such as commercial banks. So there, there needs to be a redefinition, a redefining of business models particularly with banks, and there needs to be a redefinition, redefining of private sector and their role, especially in a market like Africa. At Equity Group, so that we can show some real cases of, of action, which is, I suppose, the theme of the broader conference, we have redefined our business model where we have a twin engine, a economic engine, which is your typical financial services, but importantly to the capacity building that I mentioned earlier, we have a social engine where we have a foundation that does entrepreneurship training, financial literacy, send kids to school. These two engines work together to catalyze each other. It capacitates the value chain, it helps connect, and as a financial institution, we put the oxygen that will allow velocity over time yeah. to play out. Yeah, thank you, Brent. Um, over to Binta, my colleague in the Agra board. Um, so, and Binta is a very experienced banker. So from her perspective, what are the steps that we need most to, to really uh, get more action on innovative finance? And I add to that actually a bit of a, of a surprise question. You're going to get angry with me now. It's like, why shouldn't we be a little bit tougher on private banks I agree. through regulatory interventions? I think I'll be very humble today and say that commercial banks, why we have blended financing now is because somehow commercial banks have failed financing sectors. Feel, feel free sectors. to speak to the audience. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> You were attacking me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm getting scared. That's why. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, in a humble manner, we can say really that um, blended finance exists today because uh, commercial banking were uh, really not keen in financing um, sectors like agriculture. I remember when I was um, um, managing director of EcoBank in Mali, uh, you know, Mali is an agriculture country, per se. Uh, we had on our target market non-agriculture sectors. And agriculture sector was uh, like, um, how can I say this, uh, 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 blacklisted, Aye. if I can say so. Uh, because 
of the fact that uh, we have perishable goods, uh, it's risky, and I think uh, the lady of, um, of uh, World Bank mentioned that, and for several reasons. So you were talking about frustration, and that was frustrating. Mm. If you work in an environment where uh, a, a sector is key, and as a commercial banker, in your target market, is, it is said that it is a risk, and you are in a risk environment, and you are uh, 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 managing risk. So it's frustrating. So that, that, is, that is true. So uh, to, to go back to uh, maybe, uh, have we made progress? I think, yes, we have made progress. Um, by the time when uh, I'm, I'm talking about this situation, I think less than 5% of assets of bank uh, was invested in uh, agriculture, whether working capital or, 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 or investment. Yeah. Um, and I think today, uh, in an aggregate manner uh, in Africa, we can talk probably uh, about 10%. But blended finance uh, today is um, a strategic way to tackle uh, investment, to tackle financing so, of the agriculture sector. Binta, so I hear you say that uh, because of all these innovations, blended yeah. finance, you, you, you believe, you, you know that the aggregate lending and money flows from private absolutely. banks into agro and food has, act has materially increased. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Because there are partnerships today that have been built with commercial banks, uh, which takes into account the, the, the risk that is uh, being the risk for yeah, commercial yeah. banks and that it has, is being taken by partners, investors, investment funds, uh, etc. So absolutely, I think that uh, we have moved forward and that we were able to make uh, progress. As Thank such. you. Thank you, Binta. Uh, can I go over to Temi? Uh, and um, I think you, you could provide us with some case studies where examples of where blended finance methods or instruments have really made a difference. Thanks very much. My name is Temi Adegurui, uh, managing partner Sire Consulting in Nigeria. Um, I think. Uh, so is that the private equity? This sort is of the fund, fund manager? This is the management consulting firm. I'm okay. going to be speaking from the lens of the private equity. Yeah. Uh, so I guess one thing that is very clear that, we, that we've established over time is that uh, there is a very clear gap in, uh, you know, Market times financing into you know high risk um, you know financing areas uh, in Africa, particularly in agriculture. Now speaking specifically in agriculture, and I, I think from the last speaker, you 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 would also you know uh, uh, note that it's really you know very clear that there's a very big gap, especially from uh, the perspective of the commercial banks. And that's why the, the concept of blended finance actually comes to play. Um, blended finance has really been extensively applied in, in recent times uh, in the agri uh, food landscape in Africa. And there are a few uh, case studies uh, to actually pick from. I will speak about two very quickly. Um, the first one is uh, a fund called the Fund for Agricultural Finance in Nigeria. This is a Nigeria focused fund, uh, which is managed by our sister company, Sahel Capital in, in Nigeria. Um, Fafin, we call it, we call it Fafin. Fafin is, uh, is focused on investing in high impact, um, commercially you know, viable businesses in agriculture um, within the country, across the country. And um, Fafin, of course, was launched in 20, 2014. And between 2014 and now, uh, it's been able to close about eight investments in, in high impact agribusinesses. And one thing that is interesting with, um, with the way Fafin Fund operates, because the, the, the fund size, total fund size itself is about 66 million USD. Um, the way it operates is Fafin combines multiple uh, investment instruments like equity, uh, uh, in this case, direct equity 
or a quasi equity uh, kind of approach where you're mixing debt and equity financing uh, models uh, to fund specific aspects of, uh, of, of companies' operations. Um, of course, equity is focused on really, um, you know, addressing many of the finance every, um, you know, aspect of the operations of the businesses. Um, but the interesting thing is that the fund comes with a technical assistance facility, uh, which I think uh, makes blended finance schemes actually really very appropriate to agribusinesses. Because with uh, technical assistance facilities, agribusinesses are then able to, you know, uh, apply some sort of flexibility in financing specific areas of their businesses that require capacity building. And this is very important for agribusinesses because you, you, one thing that I wanted to mention earlier also is that we, we've seen, I would say we've seen an increase in financing to um, fairly large scale agribusinesses. But I think the biggest challenges that we have in Africa is that many of the agribusinesses are quite small scale. And that's where we have the biggest players here because, um, I mean... Tammy, I, I have to... Can I ask you a question? Because I, I, I do apologize, I have to manage time. But can, can you address one specific question? Mm -hmm. What is the fund's biggest challenge? Is it finding capital or deploying capital? Both. So the, the first one is funding. Of course, ensuring... I mean, the fund is supposed to get to over 100 million USD, uh, close to about 60, 66 million USD. But I think deploying capital, the biggest challenge with deploying capital is that many of the businesses are actually not really investment ready. ready. So yeah. you need a lot of focus around technical assistance facility to really build their capacities, uh, conduct market research, try to identify the right trainees and make sure that you actually have the right management teams in place to manage the businesses. Then you can then deploy you know, your equity or, or yeah. quasi equity. Yeah. And that's really been the biggest issues in agribusiness. Um, Timmy, I, I, I really would like to ask you to close if you okay. can. Yeah. The, so the la I'll quickly talk about the last one, which is um, uh, a fund called the Social Enterprise Fund for, Af for Agriculture in Africa. Now, this is quite interesting because the CEFA fund is directly targeting social agricultural enterprises, really small scale enterprises that are working directly with small other farmers, exploring uh, backward integration programs at the community level and with very small ticket size. And I, I really want to emphasize that, that if we really want to uh, make any significant progress in financing businesses, agribusinesses in Africa, we need to make sure that we are really deploying a lot more blended finance schemes that have smaller ticket sizes and have the right opportunity, provide the right opportunity to, to, to businesses to experiment, to innovate, and to sort of adjust along the way. Uh, that's Thank you. probably the only way we can yeah. unlock opportunities. Thank you, Tammy. So, uh, Theobald, what, what, what can, what can the, what's the role of t uh, technology? There's a lot of excitement, digital solutions, and that's going to be, that's going to save us all. So, any, any thoughts, any examples where technology makes this easier? Thank you. Um, Theobald Sabi, I'm the managing director of the National Bank of Commerce. I also chair the local bankers association here. So I think when we talk of food systems, I think it's also important to appreciate that we must then also talk of uh, agri businesses. And therefore when I connect to the question of technology and financing, I think it's more around how technology can help solve the problems towards uh, access to finance uh, for agriculture, but in particular, agricultural-based businesses. And I think we all agree that the specific challenges for Africa, and I think um, my colleague has just alluded to it, that the small scale nature of the agri producers or agri players in Africa make the cost of servicing to be quite prohibitive. And when you link 
that with the problems around data, information asymmetry, and infrastructure, uh, that to a large extent, and to also uh, to speak about the specific situation of Tanzania, that has been the main bottleneck. So it's not that commercial banks are not necessarily shying away, it's the practical challenges of getting financing into, into the sector from a cost to serve perspective, credit analysis, and just the overall value chain itself. And this is where technology comes in handy because technology has the potential to make uh, credit uh, processes to be easier using data that we can now access via very uh, non-traditional ways or means. Um, technology has the potential to make the supply chain to work, oh, yeah. you know, and... Uh, and is it happening? Is it, it happening? It is, it is happening. I'll give you an example. So when we talk of food systems, and as I said, it, we must talk of agribusinesses, one of the critical challenges is just risk management for the farmers. And technology is now making it possible, for example, to develop um, weather-based indexes for insurance, for example. And in my bank, we've you know, been able to introduce uh, crop insurance to farmers working with our, with our partners, which actually brings me to the next point, that technology is making it possible to partner. And we've seen it even in the case of Tanzania. The telecom companies are partnering with banks uh, to make uh, lending possible and ac accessible. We are seeing the government uh, also taking steps um, around that. For example, there is a warehouse uh, receipting system in Tanzania and technology uh, will make that possible. Extension services uh, through technology. So I think technology has the potential yeah. to really transform how we provide finance. So when we link that with blended finance to make it overall cheaper, we should be able to make meaningful progress. And Tanzania has some Fantastic quite uh, good and, and very good to hear that we're actually deploying it and that it's happening. Samuel, last uh, speaker. Um, there's this question in how far that blended finance models should be tailored to specific sectors like horticulture, for example. Uh, could you say something about that? Thank you, Mr. Brecken, and um, it's good to be here. My name is Samuel Achianu. I'm Managing Director of the Mascot Foundation Africa Growth Fund. This is funded uh, by the Mascot Foundation and led by MIDA. Um, we're set up as a blended <coughs> finance facility. Let me just start off there. Uh, we're looking to deploy $150 million into what we call investment vehicles. Uh, an example would be what Tammy spoke about um, as, as, as a private equity fund. And through these investment vehicles, we're looking to get uh, to 200 SMEs with financing. Um, now, um, we're not sector specific uh, because we're focusing on SMEs, we're going an agnostic diagnostic route. So when we invest in a particular IV or investment vehicle, that investment vehicle would invest in about, we hope about 10 SMEs and could do several sectors, including agribusiness, um, the businesses around agribusiness and other SME businesses. Now, why do I say we're set up as a blended finance facility? We've set up our investment policy to be able to respond with different instruments, right? So four different instruments, and I would say five if I add our technical assistance facility. We can do debt, we can do equity, we can do quasi-equity and its various forms, and we can do um, also first loss. So in one of our, we've, we've actually for now deployed about less than 10% less than of the fund Sorry, we've deployed 15% of the fund into four IVs now. We expect to get to 20, but in one of the IVs that we invested, we deployed four of our instruments. So we have first loss on currency exposure in Africa, because fo we're focused on Africa. We know currencies are fluctuating all over the place in Africa. So what we're saying to that particular IV is that we're providing you a first loss 
facility. If you lose money due to currency losses, that first loss facility will pick it up. The second thing we're doing is we're providing concessional debt to this um, investment vehicle to be able to extend credit to SMEs in their, in their target portfolio at a lowered rate, right? Lower than market rates. Now, we're not creating a subsidy. We know that rates in Africa are very expensive. In Ghana, you're borrowing money at 35%. So if we're able to blend it down to 15 or 18%, we're not, we're not wrecking the market. We're making a difference and we're making sure that capital will go to SMEs where they need it. Now, the other thing that I'm going to say is that our technical assistance facility is robust and spread across all the activities that are needed to do three key things. Create value for the SMEs, one, make sure that they operate, they're operating effectively and can meet the standards and benchmarks that they need to be competitive in their sector. Two, make sure they have functional capability. That is management experts in finance, marketing, and all the general areas and HR. And then three, make sure that they are compliant. So ESG is very important. It, become, it comes at a cost. How do we help SMEs to be able to meet those things and to be able to mitigate risk into the future? So those would be the, that is the way we're set up, and that is how we're, we expect to be um, changing the system. And Mr. Brecken, just to add to that, we're mobilizing capital. So every investment we do in an investment vehicle is a maximum of, say, 40%. If we put $150 million to work in 20 IVs, we expect to mobilize 300 to 400 million dollars into the African continent into SMEs. You mentioned priority sector financing, and I think this is a model that lends itself directly to that. We are using philanthropic capital to do this, but we're also, when we invest in IVs, we're leveraging DFIs, we're leveraging other investors into this particular IV that we invest in. So if we want to do something for the agri sector or for the horticulture sector, this model lends itself directly to that. First of all, set up the financial instruments that can respond to the specific challenges in the horticulture sector. In some countries, it could be even establishing LCs. In some countries, you have difficulties with, with your bank establishing a healthy LC for you. Can you use a blended fi financing facility to, to resolve that? Yes, you could. Do you have the technical assistance ability to establish a traceability system, as an example? So these are all examples where you could, you could set up a model put some philanthropic capital together, put some commercial capital together to make sure it's sustainable, and continue to deploy this across the target sector that Thank you, you want Samuel. to. Thank you, Samuel. Fantastic. Yeah. So you're, you're in the camp of the optimists, clearly. Um, a realist, because we're doing it. We're doing everything that everybody cool. has said on this panel. Fantastic. Good. I would, like, I would like to thank the panel for your contribution. It was really engaging. And apologies that I had to really had to to drive it like a schoolmaster. So apologies for that. So can I invite um, the next panel on the floor? Now, I would like to start with is the Honorable Lydia de Fatima, a minister from Mozambique. Please join us in the middle. I would like to invite uh, Ruth Zaipuna, Hedwig Sivertson, uh, Dr. Birama Sidibe, uh, Mrs. Sheila Bienkia, and Carolyn Gitinji. Welcome, uh, Excellency. Um, we were going to chat in our, uh, in our fireside chat about what the role of blended finance, how, how have you seen it playing out in Mozambique? And maybe, maybe you can just address the basic question, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And if you are either, why, when it comes to deploying capital, blended finance in agriculture and foods in Africa? My name is Lydia Cardoso. Uh, I'm the Minister of Sea and Land Waters uh, and Fisheries in Mozambique. Uh, with regard to the subject that we are uh, discussing today, uh, in Mozambique, of course, uh, the challenges that we, we listen here from Mozambique are uh, similar, in, it seems, that in all Africa. So the blended finances that we are using goes through uh, um, matching grants, for example. Um, we have got uh, some um, initiatives uh, in which we provide uh, support to the farmers and fishermen with projects and programs that are funded by the government and other, other uh, donors. For example, uh, we have three projects 
in Mozambique, uh, there we call mais peixe sustentável, which is uh, to provide uh, um, to to improve uh, quality of life of the fishermen, yeah. and um, we it is focus on blue economy agenda, uh, and we have a product, another project is product that is for agri uh, aquaculture, yeah. for example, and. Um, it's uh, it's something that is going r running very fast and um, these are refundable mechanisms that uh, we use we provide the the the, the loans uh, there is a small contribution from the farmers and then they improve yeah. that uh, in other hand we have got some um, other initiatives uh, like uh, um, rural enterprise financing project that um, is uh, done with the International Fund Agricultural Development, um, plus uh, cooperatives that we have been introducing the, the concept of cooperatives with the farmers so that they get more access when they are organizing in, the, in, the, in that way, they can get, get access to um, other systems. Um, the commitment of the government of Mozambique, for example, for this, uh, this uh, agricultural system is that 10% uh, uh, of our uh, general budget goes to the agriculture. And we are going to increase uh, over the, the, the time. Already 10%? Uh, 10%. That is fantastic. So yeah. you're, one of the, uh, you're one of the exceptions who actually comply with the 10% commitment. Yes, yes that's yes. fantastic. Yeah. And uh, we are going to increase uh, this amount uh, along the time. Yeah. So these are uh, some of the matching matching grant programs that we we are uh, taking uh, uh, in our country so that we can tackle with uh, with this fantastic. issue of uh, yeah. In my view any country that commits that really has fulfilled the 10% commitment should get a disproportionate amount of the support of other financial institutions. Absolutely. Good, thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Um, I would like to go to Ruth. Ruth, um, uh, as, as in the first panel, uh, short introduction, and then can you address the question how um, impact investors can play a role in scaling up proven technologies? My name is uh, Ruth Zaipuna. I work for NMB Bank uh, PLC in Tanzania. So I think since uh, Tuesday, when these meetings uh, started, we have heard a lot about the importance of agriculture in Africa, uh, the role it plays, but also the challenges that uh, agriculture in Africa faces. And this include, you know, the significant investment gap, uh, which primarily is, uh, you know, driven by the perceived risk in the agriculture sector. And I agree uh, that one among the areas where uh, investment for scaling up agriculture in Africa is critical is technology. Technology is very critical to scale up uh, 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 agriculture in Africa. But uh, now what will be the, the role of impact investors as you rightly put in your question? I think impact investors can actually play a big role in reducing the financing gap that we have been hearing about, everybody talking about. And this can be done through direct investment in sustainability-linked instruments, such as uh, green bonds or social bonds. And these investments can actually support and scale up investment in agricultural technologies. And uh, you will agree with me that uh, we have recently seen that uh, there is an increasing uh, focus, or the, the, the trend now is that uh, there is uh, an increasing uh, focus of uh, impact investors, particularly uh, considering their investments in environment, social, and governance uh, areas. Uh, I'll give an example. Last year, NMB Bank issued a gender bond for the first time, and uh, that bond was highly oversubscribed. You know, it was oversubscribed by 197%. So uh, I think this all just shows that um, investors are now not only looking at the returns that they get, but also they are looking at the impact that they are making or the, the, the impact that their investments 
are creating in the society or the environment, but also in the sustainability of the world that uh, we live. Uh, but also I think that um, impact investors can also support capacity building programs offered by partner banks or companies. And the best example here is IFC Green Social and Sustainable Bond Program. This program actually helps NMB banks significantly. You know, they trained our people, they helped us to understand and come up with um, a sustainable bond framework that was all actually aligned with the International Capital Markets Association uh, principles. So, um, and as you already know, uh, the proceeds from the NMB uh, gender bond were actually used to impact uh, SME-led uh, uh, businesses that are impacting different sectors of the economy, including uh, uh, agriculture. Ruth, but if also, I can ask, because uh, yes. where the rubber hits the road is numbers, and without calling specific number, question. Does NMB Bank, is NMB Bank able today to, to deploy significant higher proportioning of their lending portfolio to smallholder farmers? Exactly. Um, in this particular bond, we were looking for 25 billion Tanzania shilling. We raised the 74 billion uh, Tanzania shilling. By the end of the year, 100% was already deployed. And this actually impacted close to 3,000 smallholder right. farmers right. in Tanzania. Yeah. Right. Uh, last point, as I finish, I think impact investors can also act as a catalyst for more investments in the sector from, non, from, from other non-impact investors. I think the technological impact that uh, these impact investors can make in the sector, you know, by making the sector now uh, more, uh, more invested, particularly from a, 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 from, from a technology point of view, means that once the sector is transformed, I believe the reduced risk can actually attract other investors in the sector, and which means can you know, help to scale up uh, the investment in this particular sector, not only from impact investors, but also from other non-impact investors, now that the, the, the sector will be transformed to reduce the perceived risk in agriculture. Thank you. I thank think you. in the interest of time, you know, these are the- Thank you, Ruth, fantastic. Yeah, um, uh, Edvig, uh, Edvig is, um, is, is a real expert on the topic. She has also co-written the chapter in the Agra report <laughs> on the financing solutions. Um, Edvig, I'm going to slightly reframe this question that um, you prepared for. And, and, and the core question is, in your view, do we need new innovative solution for blended finance? Or do we have all the solutions actually available, but we need more scale or we need more effort or more commitment? What is it? I think the beauty of the food system thinking is that we are combining uh, the three things, right? We are looking at food and nutrition. We are looking at environmental issues. We're looking at climate and we're looking at the debt crisis. I can't look at you, right? No, no, don't look at me, no, look at the audience. <laughs> so it feels very impolite. Yeah. Um, so I think the, 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 the new opportunity in blended finance is that we look holistically at the, as these three crises that we are facing. So the debt crisis, the food crisis, and the environmental and climate crisis. And what I came to understand is that, I mean, we should use uh, the crisis funds to invest in long-term food systems transformation. Uh, so for example, food crisis, cash for work, uh, making, using food aid to invest in environmental, uh, building riches, doing terracing, etc. So that combination of uh, issues, sugar tax to invest in healthy school meals. I think that is a direct combination of taxing the harmful and investing it in sustainable food systems. And I think those opportunities, those are the new blended thinking that I see that we should exploit much more. Because Frank, you're talking if we're optimist or pessimist. I'm an optimist that there's enough money in the world because we give a lot of money to fossil fuel subsidies. We give a lot of money to agricultural subsidies. That money alone adding up is enough to address the three crises. 
the debt crisis, the food crisis, and the climate crisis. So it's really a repurposing of money. Uh, we're both from Holland. There was a report that I'm came out no, yesterday. No, 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 I'm from Belgium. Oh, sorry. So. <laughs> sorry, big sorry. mistake. <laughs> okay, I'm from Holland. <laughs> yesterday and the, and the day before yesterday, two reports were released. The first report said agricultural subsidies are harming the environment. Half of the agricultural subsidies in Holland are bad for biodiversity. So we are controverting. And the other report was that the fossil fuel industry is much more than our climate fund. So we have set apart money for climate, but the fossil subsidies in Holland alone are much more than that fund. So sometimes I feel we're in a boat, we're trying to get the water out of the boat, but there's holes all over the boat. The money is flowing to the things that are harmful and making things worse. So that's the pessimist in me. But I think if we combine uh, by taxing and making harmful practices more expensive and investing that money in sustainable food systems through blending or through other mechanisms, I think it's possible. Edwig, that idea about win-win-win with uh, healthy school meals um, and uh, you, you do that through supporting the local food and agro system, is that getting traction? Is, is it already happening or is it just in the ID stage? There? No, I think that the, the attention for school meals is there, but I would like to link it to sugar tax, for example, right? A yeah. lot of the urban kids in Africa are obese because of, of, of drinking soft drinks. So, and I think then for people, it becomes much more acceptable to get those taxes. And I think that is an issue at government level because normally government, if they get money, they need to put it in the general kitty. But I think the public willingness to pay tax it will be higher if they know that the sugar tax is going to healthy school meals. Yeah. So I would call on governments to allow that, right? Yeah. And not have the, the general treasury kitty to yeah. for that you don't know where your sugar tax is going. So Good, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Edwig. Uh, Victoria, um, a key criteria for measuring the socioeconomic impact of agricultural investments, including uh, small holders. So, how, how can we deal with the right indicators for measuring impact and progress? Thank you uh, for the question. And before I go there, and because we are speaking about the question of blended finance, uh, when we mobilize for blended finance, we usually are looking at incentivizing the institutional investors and persons who wouldn't bring their capital into the segments or, that are underfunded. But we also worry that actually a lot of times the blended finance vehicles actually take the characteristic and the profile of the risk appetite of the institutional investor. And what then that happens is that inclusive growth that we are actually seeking to advance um, doesn't happen because the uh, private companies that end up accessing capital still remain those ones that are at $2 million and $3 million. So we have used risk capital but we have not necessarily uh, gotten, you know, the, the businesses that really are struggling to be able to come uh, into the space of accessing more capital. A conversation for another day. When we talk about um, socioeconomic development and impact metrics, I think the most important is really increased incomes and poverty reduction. It's so obvious when we talk about increased incomes and it being an indicator of progress. Um, but then when you go to development programs today, you actually look at uh, many, many uh, 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 projects that if you asked what was the level of incomes of these smallholder farmers at the start of the program and somebody says, we do not know, but how then will you know that there is actually real progress? And in the absence of increased incomes, it also means that uh, we are not building the resilience of these communities mm -hmm. and resilience is really what we should be advancing. Um, employment rates is really important to look at agricultural investments need to solve for increased uh, employment rates. The other thing is access to nutrition, food security and nutrition. The moment the high, a higher percentage of the population is accessing uh, uh, the right uh, food, the moment the diets are diversified, we know that we are making progress. It is just not about the people living in cities 
accessing, you know, very good diversified diets and starting to move to nuts and seeds, then the peri-urban poor are actually, you know, taking on too much, you know, sugar as, as, as uh, and then we are having a health problem, rural areas, it's more calories, you know, and less of diet. So uh, that, that I think would be important. The other thing is women economic empowerment. When we see that actually through agricultural investments, more women are playing as economic actors and just not beneficiaries and data points, you know, for purposes of, 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 of development. It's not about how many women have been trained, how many women have accessed inputs. It is how many women actually have proper income are accessing and controlling productive assets are at the decision table making uh, those decisions. And I think lastly, because of time, is what is the impact of these agricultural investments from a systemic uh, change perspective? And I'm very wary about using this word because I feel like as development professionals, we throw it around. But yet it is so important that how is the infrastructure in these places where we are locating private sector investments actually looking uh, is, is, is movement from firm to market being addressed from you know cooling logistics are we having a better irrigation system that is actually matching these investments that there is actually something that is shifting as far as how the system is playing because when you see that you actually get to see tangible thank you. progress thank you victoria uh, dr birama um, Innovations mechanisms for de-risking agricultural investments. Okay, um, thank you, Frank. I'm Birama Sidibe. I've been fortunate uh, to be part of the conversation last year. I've seen that some progress. I'm here uh, reporting on our experience in ABC Fund. I'm part of the investment committee. Uh, so uh, we see that uh, we're looking for impact and viability. So the impact is easy to measure, but the viability is really where you talk of, uh, uh, I mean, risk management. That's why uh, from all the tools box that were, deployed, that were discussed during the past two days, uh, from uh, agricultural insurance, uh, credit guarantee, risk sharing, uh, technology and capacity building, to cite few of them, uh, we, I believe that uh, we should uh, come up with uh, more approaches to, uh, to risk sharing, to minimize the risk and to share the risk between all shareholders of the financing, agricultural financing uh, value chain. Um, in doing that, rather than just seeing the agricultural investment uh, to a farmer as a risky activity, we share the risk between all the stakeholders of that. So coming to the blending finance, I truly believe that uh, all the mechanism that is here should be streamlined in the stakeholder processes to make it more efficient. On the innovation, really I see a kind of alliance to build a risk management mechanism. Uh, I don't like too much the, the term the risking, there is no, no risk-free business, mm. but at least for the stakeholder to come up together uh, to minimize the risk first, because minimizing the risk globally for the business is minimizing the risk for each of the participants. That could be one of the ways to go, but to have it that happen, it has to be streamlined in the processes. Are we progressing? Of... Are we progressing? Are we moving in the right direction? Yeah, we, we are progressing not to the speed I, I was hope, but uh, yeah. the recommendation is for the risk to be considered as a common affair and to be commonly managed uh, so that when you invest in a farmer, you need to make sure that it's not up to the farmer to, to look for the off-take agreement. It's a common responsibility to do that. In, in having that kind of uh, approach could, could help to uh, make a big progress. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Um, going to Sheila, so how can public-private partnerships play a role in all this, and particularly bringing expertise and finance to smallholders? My name is Sheila Bienkia. I am from uh, Zepri, where I insure out of Comesa. And um, this is a very interesting topic for us. I head um, financial inclusion and uh, partnerships. So I'll start first of all by saying um, the past few days we've been hearing a lot about good um, initiatives going on all over the continent. I think the first step would be to build on those existing partnerships and um, kind of create a platform where everyone can plug in. 
Um, at Zepri, right now, we're running a project um, in the Horn of Africa, supporting pastoralists to build resilience in uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya. And that is a key example of coming together and diversifying. We'll be hearing a lot about risk, and risk management really is about scale and diversity. So if we have such programs that already exist, and then we just plug in and expand um, you know, the players and the space and diversify the risk, this will strengthen partnerships. Um, secondly, we need to do look at appropriate solutions. We talked about appropriate solutions. We recognize these are smallholder farmers. So when we are speaking about um, things like, uh, we need to be innovative about things like collateral. Uh, take into account the cultural context. You know, if the land is, is uh, communally owned, what are the alternatives that we can use to attract finance into the sector? Um, we also need to fix, um, the, that's part of fixing the demand side. And we've seen that once that is done, for instance, again, on this World Bank project that we are implementing in the Horn of Africa, private capital is mobilized. We have lots of risk carriers coming in to support um, the business with the pastoralists. Um, technology, capacity building, very, very key. Um, there's tools that we can do around uh, ground truthing, uh, managing the information yep. asymmetry between uh, the bankers and uh, using remote sensing kind of tools. And we have built capacity and uh, we have the tools in place and some are being deployed. So I'm an optimist when it comes to that. I think we know that solutions Fantastic. and we can put them in place and drive um, Investments into okay, I've noted you down on the side of the optimists. That's good. And then last but not least, Carolyn, as McKinsey, so you have a very good high level perspective. I know the question is around creating cross-border investment, but actually I would like you from where you sit as McKinsey, you oversee this all, you see all the partners. The, the basic question is, are we moving in the right direction? Is everybody coming to the party, private sector, public sector, etc.? What's your perspective on that? Thank you. Um, Caroline Gavinji. I am an associate partner at McKinsey. Um, I work for my Nairobi office. Great to be here. First on your question on are we progressing? I think the numbers do show that we are progressing, right? The, the share of uh, blended finance funding that's actually going into agriculture has increased, has actually doubled over the last five years, the share itself. So the numbers are increasing. The scale at which it's happening is probably the question. And I think uh, part of it is a question of there's a small scale, you know, project that's done in one country. How do you replicate it across Africa? You know, a lot of the examples that you've had here are very country specific, apart from the one that, um, that Sheila just shared about the Horn of Africa. A lot of them are country specific, but how do we actually achieve massive scale by going across the continent? And that's, that's a bigger question. Now, in terms of, um, collaboration that's happening. I think people are coming together. I think there's a realization that inclusive growth will actually remain a myth if we are not able to unlock affordable credit from the perspective of a smallholder farmer, which means not just the rate that they, they get, but also the fact that they can shield themselves from shocks that come along the way, right? Um, and so we've seen certain collaborations. One vein of collaboration is actually trying to get to the bottom of the pyramid. So how do how do we access these populations? Uh, you've seen a lot of partnerships, for instance, in Kenya right now, there's a partnership between telcos, banks, a DFI, um, trying to understand how do we actually lend to pastoralists, right? And really get to the bottom of, you know, can we use mobile data because they're actually using Fuliza and KCB and PESA? Can we track that data and use it to better, you know, price their risk, right? Um, there's also another vein uh, on getting to the bottom of the pyramid where banks are now using their, their customers to now get to the smallholder farmers. Whether it's agro dealers and trying to use supply chain finance as a way to get to the bottom of the pyramid. So there's partnerships that are happening on that vein. And then there's partnership on the thread of um, enhancing trans, uh, you know, TA, right? To, to whether it's foundations that are formed by banks, uh, or other organizations trying to pitch in local TA firms that are now going down to the grassroots. And you see a blend of whatever is actually deployed in the market has to embed in it something on the TA front. So you see a lot of collaboration on those two veins. And I think, you know, progress is, is minimal. Hopefully we will scale it. 
it will take time, but we also need to think about a cross-continent uh, solution versus a country. country but we solution. take home all, so I heard as well, in the last five years, the total amount of blended finance deployed has doubled. So it's still share. from a, it's from a small scale, yes, but it, at least it has doubled. Okay, yeah. noted. Yeah. So next year we have to come back to that and then hopefully it has quadrupled. Thank you very much, everybody. So we are now well into injury time. I would like the panel to leave the floor and I would like to hand over for closing remarks to Dr. Eleni Gabri, who has promised me that she can do closing remarks in three minutes. Wow, that is fantastic. I suggest that I don't come back to the floor, so I say goodbye from here. Leave the, leave the floor for Lena, and uh, I invite the panel to leave. Dr. Lena, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, I am now have a gun pointed at my head. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at UNDP, and uh, we are launching uh, in, in New York, and uh, we are launching an initiative called Timbuktu. And I want to just touch on that because it really does pick up on almost all the points that uh, came up uh, in the panel discussion in both sessions. Um, so I think that, you know, if, if we look a little bit and, and, and hone in a little bit on innovation, uh, and digital and tech startups, uh, which is the area that I'm working on. Um, what we see is that there has been enormous progress over the last five years. Uh, 2021, 2022, 250% growth per year, reaching about $5 billion of financing coming into the continent, uh, into this sector. It all looks great. The fastest growing uh, region in the world for venture capital uh, and actually holding um, the pattern despite downturns in financing in every other region in the world. So what's going on? Well, when you look a little bit behind, uh, beneath the surface, what you see is that 89% of the capital is foreign capital. So we have virtually no domestic capital coming into our knowledge economy. There is no region in the world historically that has relied this much on foreign capital to grow its uh, economy, uh, or sp specifically innovation. Secondly, 83% of the capital is going to four countries, Nigeria, Kenya, Egypt, South Africa, actually reverse order, South Africa, Egypt. So there's, there's really a, a lack of diffusion uh, of, of capital uh, because it's, it's you know, still uh, very much focused on these four countries for reasons uh, to do with historical, but also risk aversion. The other issue is that 60% of capital is going uh, specifically to one sector, fintech. So we have to do better. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do with this uh, new initiative called Timbuktu, uh, which is basically uh, purported or, or we're, uh, our ambition is to be the largest blended finance facility in the world for African innovation. Uh, and what we've looked at is how blended finance has worked in other places, because the challenge we have, and, and I think it was said on the panel, is how do you crowd in uh, domestic capital? Uh, how do you get into that early stage risk capital? I think Victoria put it very well. Um, you know, you do blended finance, but then you find that everybody, uh, the, the, the blended finance institution is acting like uh, the, the, the very risk averse institutional investor that we're trying to actually uh, crowd crowd in more of. So in other words, if we're still in the 2 million and above ticket size, then we haven't solved the problem. Uh, Tony Blair Institute estimated in 2021 that uh, the financing gap for early stage risk capital is 90 billion for Africa. So that 5 billion is still a drop in the bucket. So we need to do better. Um, so the question is, how do you crowd in domestic capital? How do you crowd in corporate capital? How do you crowd in diaspora capital? And how do you do that in a way that you achieve the Pan-African opportunity? Because that's what attracts the capital. Um, and, and enables us to grow uh, the, the scale that we need is to leverage the AFCFTA. So our, our initiative is really looking at um, best practices. And I think we've seen a lot of bl blended finance attempts and, and you know, some progress on the continent. But uh, what we need to see is something like what Israel did in the 1990s with the Yozma program, where they took $100 million of government funding, created 10 funds, 
uh, that was you know, each farmed out uh, 10 million each, crowded in an additional 15 million from private sector. In five years, the government exited fully at cost, so no upside risk to the government, uh, where no upside gains were, were captured by the government's uh, de-risking capital, and the upside went to the private LPs in those 10 funds. That was an enormous success, got leveraged to $3.2 billion in 10 years. Those are the kinds of numbers that we should be talking about. So um, I think my three minutes are up, but what I want us to do as we continue this conversation here on the continent is to think about how do we get beyond the small efforts where we are right now? How do we learn from global practices that really can take us much further? And how do we keep uh, in mind these three things? Domestic capital, domestic capital, domestic capital, uh, corporate capital, and diaspora, which is really the untapped opportunity. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.